inspiring interviews with today's top landlords. This is the Rental Income Podcast. And now, Dan Lee. I've got a really awesome podcast for you today. Joining us on the show for the second time is Mike Rams. Mike was on the show about three years ago. He's a really successful landlord. He's been at this for about 15 years, and he's built up a really good portfolio. But things haven't always been smooth sailing. During the last market crash, he actually got foreclosed on a couple different times for some properties he bought. So I want to talk to him today about what happened and what he's doing differently when he buys rental properties to make sure this doesn't happen again. So let's take a real quick break. We'll come back in 30 seconds and we'll catch up with Mike. Are you having a hard time finding great investment properties? Unfortunately, the best deals are rarely found locally. Successful investing begins with the right properties in the right markets. Norada Real Estate provides everything you need to invest in the best deals across the U.S. Our simple, proven system will help you create real wealth and passive monthly cash flow. Get your free copy of the ultimate guide to passive real estate investing at noradarealestate.com slash guide. That's N-O-R-A-D-A realestate.com slash guide. Hey, Mike, welcome back to the podcast. Well, thanks, Dan. This has been fun. I enjoy doing this kind of stuff. Awesome. I, I can't believe it's been three years since you were here last. Um, I but, know, really. But Thanks for thanks for coming back on. I, I know there's um there's a lot of stuff that that you've been up to the last couple of years, and I I want to see what you've been doing. Um, now the last time we talked, you had fifty rentals. How many places have you picked up in the last three years? I think I'm up, I'm up around sixty two now, somewhere awesome. around there. So maybe maybe another twelve or so. That is great. And, and you self manage your properties. Are are you still doing that today? Yeah, I'm still doing that. So how I don't much, know how wise that is, but now I'm still doing <laughs> that. So I enjoy it. I enjoy it. How much time does that take to manage 62 properties? Like in, in an average day, how, how many hours do you work? Well, uh, as far as the rental properties themselves, I try not to put any more than half a day okay. um, into them. Awesome. So, that's awesome. Yeah. Well, l- let's take a step back and j- just catch everyone up. I know when you were on the podcast before, we kind of went through your story. But for anyone that hasn't heard that episode, why don't we just ask you real quick about how you got started buying rental properties? Sure. Um, I guess I started, oh, I don't know how many years ago now, 15 or so, maybe a little bit more than that. Um, and uh had a good friend of mine who he was a he was a landlord and I always kind of thought well, that'd be kind of fun to do but my wife never said it was you know she loved the pieces but I'm not the smartest cookie in the in the jar that's for sure <laughs> so I'm not able to she said you know you don't have no degree or anything like that you're just a just a mechanic Mike you don't know how to do that but I finally convinced her to buy the first property and then we got the second property and. Then she started looking for properties. Hey, did you ever think about this property? Maybe we should buy this one or that one. And then it just slowly turned into uh, now I'm up to what a uh, sixty two or something yeah. like that. So how long did it take before you were able to quit your job? Well, that was a tough decision. I had only about I think I don't quote me to this, but I'll be close. I had about maybe eight or nine properties while I was still working a full-time job. Wow. And uh, I was the, and, and was, so I was probably working my job for about maybe five years, somewhere, <laughs> somewhere in that neighborhood. Uh, and then it got to the point where I had to give up one or the other. Okay. And I, I was ready to get, I was ready to get out, get out of my job. It was a good job, but after a while, I was there for 25 years and, you know, you get tired of doing yeah. something like that. So eight or nine yeah. properties is all it really took to to get pretty close to your income? Yeah, that was about, yeah, was about, about that. That's but incredible. But then right after that, then I probably jumped up 10 properties in uh, maybe in a year or two right, right after that. So was it because you weren't working anymore, you had more time to go out there and find more deals? Is that why exactly. you grew so fast? Yeah. Okay. Yep. Now, exactly. let's talk about your criteria, because I know that we've talked a, a lot about this um, off the podcast, me, me and you talk a lot, and um, we're always kind of debating the 1% rule and the, the 2% rule. 
and you used to be a fan of the 1% rule. That That's where you buy a property for $100,000 and you rent it for $1,000 a month. But you, you've kind of changed your opinion on the the 1% rule. That was something that you you kind of followed when you were starting, but now you're looking for, for 2% rule deals. Um, let, 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 let's talk about this for a second. So why, sure. why do you think the 2% rule is so much better than the 1% rule? Is it just that it's twice as much money? Well, two things happen in my particular life. This is the neat thing about real estate. Each person has its own individual way of handling real estate. And that work, work, that's the nice thing about, you know, having real estate. You can go and do it the way that best works for you. When I was still employed, I had a paycheck coming in every two weeks. And so if uh, one of the apartments was empty, uh, it was not that big of a deal because I still had a paycheck. Mm-hmm. Um, but I was still under the 1% rule when I quit um, my my job, I was still working at the one percent rule, and um, but I was still buying properties at the one percent rule because I didn't realize, you know, because I just well I didn't realize I was I didn't know what I was doing. Yeah. And uh, so then it got to the point where I was buying everything with only a one percent rule, and um, then when the, the the market crashed, and then that's when I really got hurt, and that's when as we talked in the last episode, the last time we talked. I think I lost like five or six properties of foreclosures. Yeah. And, uh, and now, so, why was that? Like, did you lose the properties just because there wasn't enough cash flow there? Is that what happened? I lost the properties because I had to finally sit down and make a hard decision which one are the best properties to get rid of and which one should I still try to keep. Okay. And so I had to make a decision that way. Okay. Uh, the, the ones that I lost, I said, okay, well, for whatever reason, they might have been the best ones for me to feel personally to lose. I went ahead and lost those personally. Okay. And uh, so. the ones that you lost, were they 1% deals? Uh, pro- yeah, oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I mean, yeah, they were all 1% deals. So today, like, you wouldn't even consider buying something at 1%, right? Like, there's just not enough cash flow there for you? That is probably a true statement. As I said... I'm really not looking for places to buy any any more properties as it is now. I'm okay. just a small time guy. It's just me, and uh, uh, you know, sixty two is really more than what I should have anyway. Sure, so, yeah. So uh, I can't really give you a fair question as to what I would be looking for. Yeah. One thing I do know now that I do have what I got, I would only look for the upper level rentals instead of the any you know instead. Of, trying to find anything to rent. That's interesting. That's an interesting point. So like the lower, so you, you have bought some rentals that are on the lower part of the market, but are they just more hassle than it's worth? Well, it's sad. I can't really say that because of uh, my very first property I ever bought, I still have is a three unit and um, it's still great for me, but okay. it's not, it, it might be on the lower end of the income of the rental income. Okay. Uh, doing great for me, but, uh, I do, uh, for, I, I would have to say for the majority of the time, the, uh, single family homes are less headaches than multi units. And so if I was to look for anything, it would be single family dwellings. Okay. Compared to, to compared to apartment building or something like that. And why is that? Do you just see less oh, turnover? I, I think it's only because of the headaches. Okay, um, just less headaches with multi with yeah. single family. Okay. Now, yeah. now with um, you know, you, you've been doing this for a long time. You, you've you've looked at a lot of deals. <laughs> you, you've seen what's worked and what hasn't worked firsthand. Do you think that you can make real cash flow at one percent, or do you think you really have to be closer to two percent? to be making money on rentals? Wow, that's a tough question. <laughs> um, that's what we do here, I ask the tough have... questions. <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess, if you were to, since you're asking me that right now, right today, and I've been doing this for 
what did I say, 15, 17 years, something like yeah. that. And with my experience that has, what's happened to me in my life, I would have to say I would want only the 2% return. Okay. Okay. Um, only because of what my experience is. You know, I now, I now don't have a job. I right, don't work anywhere. Right. Right. And so, uh, I only work half days at, at my rentals. I'm an old man now. I'm ready to kind of like slow down some. And so, um, you know, that's, uh, yeah, but, um, uh, I think I know, I know a couple of people who are doing, um, uh, real well, but now I actually, I think the only people I do know who are doing well with the 1% might still have another form of income coming in. Too. Right. Right. Yeah, which, which which might be a, a big decision for that. Was, that would be what may, that would be my big decision as to if I had other money coming in, which at my time in life I don't. Coming up on the Rental Income Podcast. Recently, Mike had a whole bunch of tenants give notice at the same time that they were moving out. So I want to see what that was like because Mike's doing everything himself. So we had to get all those properties cleaned up and ready to go. He had to advertise the property, so he's dealing with a lot of phone calls and showing. So I, I want to see, first of all, what that cost and what that was like to go through that. We'll get into that in just a second, but first I want to thank our sponsor today, MyLandlordHelper.com. If you're self-managing your rental properties and you need some help, or maybe you have a property management company that you're not happy with, My Landlord Helper might be exactly what you're looking for. They are a way that you can be in control and you can self-manage your properties, but you can have a little bit of help. So if you're at work and you maybe can't take a tenant phone call, or maybe you're with your family in the evening and a tenant calls because they have an emergency, my landlord helper can deal with that problem. They can do whatever you want. So if you want to be notified, they can let you know, or if you want them to go ahead and call a repair person when a tenant has an issue... They'll do that. They'll call your people. They'll get the problem taken care of, and you'll never even have to deal with it. They can also deal with the rent collection. If a tenant doesn't pay, they can follow up with the tenant. They can file notices. Whatever you need them to do, they can help you out with, and it's a lot cheaper than having a full-service property management company. If you want to learn more, go to MyLandlordHelper.com. They have more information on their website. They have some videos you can watch. And if you want to hop on the phone with them, they're happy to talk to you and answer whatever questions you might have. That's MyLandlordHelper.com, MyLandlordHelper.com. All right, let's get back to the show. So, Mike, what was it like when all those tenants gave you notice at the exact same time? Boy, you're already trying to pick out, pick the hard things on me. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just teasing you, Dan. Um, yeah, there was. Uh, I think it was. It was the end of last year. Um, I had. Uh, oh, what was it? Seven, seven, ten, seven. Oh, eight or nine places that were that all came at the same time. And um, here again, this is another thing about apartment living compared to household living. Um, people who live in homes pretty much stay there for all my homes. I, I can't, you know, I, I have a lot of homes that I haven't been in for five five plus years. Yeah, just because I have great tenants and yeah, everything goes well, fine. But apartment living, you know, eventually somebody who lives in a one bedroom or a two bedroom. Their life changes. They have a kid, or they get married, or they, you know, want something bigger, or whatever. So they'll move out of an apartment a lot quicker than they will out of a house. Mm-hmm. And so, um, and the the, 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 the ten, eight, nine places that came empty, they were they were all apartments. Okay. And because not because I was doing any evictions, neither. It wasn't because okay they didn't pay and I had to evict them out. It was because they wanted to move on, and uh, you know everything yeah. was fine. Right. So, that, so uh, that, that was the thing. Now, I I think that's a interesting point, and, and I think it it really speaks to why you want to have a lot of rentals because if you just had eight or nine rentals and everyone left at the same time, you would be dead in the water. But because you have sixty two doors you've got other streams of income 
coming in. So it, it, it doesn't affect you as much as it would a smaller landlord. So I, I that's a true statement, and that was actually what I based my first property on. My first property was a three-unit place, mm-hmm. and I had a mortgage on it. And um, I was thinking, you know, okay, if two places, um, if one place comes empty, I can still make a little bit of money and still afford everything. Right. Even if two places go empty, at least the one place will still pay my mortgage and. I'll have to hope that I don't have any repairs on it or whatever. Right. So that and here again, it goes back to the, the idea of having multiple doors. Yeah. Uh, the more, um, so yeah, that's, that was a good, that was, that was a good thing that helped me get through a lot of it. Yeah. So when a tenant moves out today, how much do you think it costs you to fix the property up? Uh, I will, I'm looking anywhere from now. Here again, I do my own work. Okay. Yeah. So uh, that gives me the luxury. So I don't have to spend uh, a person who may still have a job and wouldn't have to do it themselves. Right. Um, so you're probably looking for anywhere from um, I would say anywhere from fifteen to fifteen hundred to, to twenty five hundred okay. somewhere in that neighborhood, depending on the size of the unit. And then depending on what all you feel you really want to do, you, whether you want to just get it re-rented or whether now is this the time to uh, put a new roof on the house or, right. you know, whatever. Right. Okay. So are there, um, when for your properties, do you like smaller places? Like for me, I like I, I think I like to, to buy places that are right around 1,000 square foot or or less. Because there's just less square footage, so there's it costs less to paint it, it costs less. Like there's just less carpet to replace, or that there's just less that can go wrong in a smaller place. Are your properties on the smaller side, or do you have bigger properties too? That's a good question too. I um, uh, pretty much, I, I guess, the majority of my properties are. Okay, now my apartment buildings, you know, the apartments are only, you know, seven, eight hundred square feet, something like that, six, seven hundred square feet, because there'll be one, one or two bedroom apartments. Mm-hmm. My houses, they probably range anywhere from, like what you were saying, maybe a thousand feet to, uh, I think I have an eighteen hundred square foot house. Um, so uh, but yeah, all in that, all in that, all in that same price. Okay. Square footage. Yeah, all, all in that about it. And I, I kind of agree with you on that. Also, I would much rather only have to fix up a paint, uh, you know, twelve hundred square foot house compared to a three thousand square right. foot house. Right. Right. Now, when you have a vacancy, are you? doing everything yourself? Or are you showing the properties? You've said that you fix the properties up yourself, but are you also showing the properties? Uh, yeah, I do that also. Okay. I, uh, I'm kind of cheap when it comes to that, I guess. I yeah. don't know if that's the right word to use, but I don't like the idea of having to pay somebody to do something that I can do. Right. Uh, here again, you got to remember, I'm, I only work half days. Right, so, right. You know, now, we- it's not like... When you had all those vacancies at the same time, like were you marketing all of those properties? Like, were you getting calls of, on every property, or did you just get one property ready and then lease it? Get another property ready and lease it. Well, that's how it started out. I would get one property ready, and then, but you know, it wouldn't take me a week. To, it wouldn't take some time a week for me to. Get 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 the properties ready or whatever. Yeah, but yeah, once it once it was ready, I'd go ahead and re you know, and start advertising. Okay, and uh, and really, let me tell you, that really gets confusing for me uh, because, like I said, I'll have ten places empty, and I'll have um, it's been it's been really I don't know I don't want to use the word hectic. That's a bad word. It's yeah. been really busy because I'll have ten fifteen people call me for one apartment. And when you have 10 apartments, 10 places empty, you know, I'm getting 150 calls. Right, right. And, uh, okay, now, which apartment did you want? Which place did you want? Where did you want? You know, know, so, and the other thing that makes it even worse for me is I have a property in three different states. 
Uh, oh, you wanted in Virginia? Oh no, you wanted in Maryland? Oh, well, where oh did you right. <laughs> <laughs> right, so yeah, that's confusing. yeah. I I don't know how you keep it all straight. Yeah, that's that's pretty crazy. Now, w- when you were first starting out, you, it, the internet wasn't as big back then. Like there just there wasn't the information that was out there today. Where I feel like a lot of people today learn how to invest from listening to podcasts or reading articles online. How did you learn Absolutely. how to invest? But I really didn't know anything. I swear the best thing that has happened to me in the last five, six, seven years are RIAs. Okay. I highly recommend going to RIAs. The real estate um, investment the, clubs. Real estate investment yeah. clubs. Yeah. And it, just talking um, to other people that are in the business and other people that are making it happen, just kind of hearing their stories and learning from them. Right. Yeah. Right. That's yeah. awesome. That, that's great. Awesome. Yeah. Well, Mike, thank you so much for, for coming back on the podcast. I, I really appreciate you taking some time to, to share your wisdom with us. Um, well, well, it's always fun. Awesome. Well, we'll have to have you back on again, and uh, we won't wait three years to, to have you back <laughs> on for the next time. All right, Mike. Well, well, thank you so much, and thank you for listening. We'll be back with a new episode next Tuesday. My name is Dan Lane, and this has been the Rental Income Podcast.